Uh, and so I really did a deep dive on the literature in that and wrote the uh, prop. Uh, this report, which is available at the Wisconsin Energy Institute website, or I do have two copies here that I'll autograph for small <laughs> And uh, 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 to really try to figure out how does energy technology innovation play into this changing energy world uh, and, and what does that mean for policy? And so uh, uh, these are the key themes. I'm not going to read them because you've all been reading them for the last five minutes, I hope. Uh, but uh, we all have seen this slide. The, the, the Lawrence uh, Livermore National Laboratory puts it out every year. And if anybody has ever looked at these over the last 20 years, they didn't really change. <laughs> you know, it was kind of scary. But in the last two years, they've changed quite a bit. And the big change, just quickly, is some of the numbers with coal and natural gas have flipped, and those renewable numbers have gotten on the charts. Now these are big numbers, and this is an important lesson for us about scale in terms of changing the energy world. And then of course, please look up at that number in gray, rejected energy at 51, 58.1%. We got a lot of work to do yet, folks, but that's a positive because we can solve this problem. Um, this is kind of an amazing uh, uh, slide. Uh, I borrowed it from the Citigroup, uh, one of the world's largest financial institutions that truly is too big to fail. And, uh, uh, <laughs> but I think it's kind of intriguing. Um, and two reports came out last year that really got my attention. Because I'm not a particularly good researcher, I read everybody else's material and borrow liberally. Uh, the first one came out from the, uh, uh, in, in September and October, in September from the Department of Energy, with the surprising title of <coughs> Revolution Now, Future, The Future Arrives for Four Clean Energy Technologies. Hold up, Rob. Uh, <coughs> the second report was from Citigroup, uh, and it was called Energy Darwinism, The Evolution of the Energy Industry. So it's kind of harder to find, but it is on the internet somewhere. I think they might have actually sold it, so maybe I have a bootleg copy there. The words revolution and evolution mean change. The contrasting parts comes from evolution as a gradual process and revolution as a sudden change of movement. So I ask you to think about whether we're witnessing an energy revolution or energy evolution or probably both. If anyone thinks that we're in the energy status quo, maybe out in the hall. I think we might have a debate. <laughs> so I um, want to read one quote from the U.S. The Department of Energy, Revolution Now, Future Arise for Four Clean Energy Technologies. They say the energy revolution is occurring in four technologies. Onshore wind, which we've heard a lot about today. Photovoltaic, which we've heard a lot about today. LED, LED lighting, which we all do because you can't buy any other kinds of lights anymore today, light bulbs, I should say, uh, and electric vehicles. Interesting. The revolution is now. That's the title from the DOA. Pretty conservative group, I think. Uh, to quote, in the last five years, they've achieved dramatic reduction in cost, and this has been accompanied by a surge in consumer, industrial, and commercial deployment. <coughs> And what I want you to remember from that quote is that last word, deployment, because I really believe there's a synergy between deployment of more renewable or clean tech energy and energy technology innovation. There really is a synergy, and I really think that's where the opportunity lies and why we really need policy to keep us moving ahead. Um, I think I brought about half my slides from NREL, so. Um, thanks so much, Daniel, for putting up all this great material. This is kind of, you know, the world we're still a little stuck in. Carbon lock-in. Uh, this is, I love this, called the Iron Triangle. Is that intimidating? Uh, but basically, the, you know, we were in this cycle here where we really couldn't get uh, new technology uh, into the energy world. I think that's changing. I think based on everything you've heard today, it's pretty obvious. But the triangle maybe has a few cracks in it. I don't think it's quite... Totally broken yet. Um, there's a lot of data out there about uh, where the U.S. is going with coal plant uh, closings. I probably won't do a deep dive into the numbers other than to say I think uh, by one report from the U.S. Government Accounting Office, which is a fairly credible group that serves Congress and the President, that a quarter of the nation's coal generation power could shut down by 2035. Isn't that amazing? Revolution? Evolution. 
You tell me. Um, but that creates a little challenge of what energy replaces it. And so I think we, we need to really have a fairly robust discussion fairly quickly about what the future is going to look like and what we want it to look like in terms of providing that scalable energy that we've talked about. So the research project really deep dived into this. There's something called the Energy Technology Innovation System. And I apologize, I work at a university. But you know, it's an academic uh, uh, description. The research on technology innovation is very, very robust. If you're interested, go out and do some searching on it. We actually know how you have technology innovation success. <coughs> Seven simple steps, and they're right here. Um, this study, and I don't often recommend you read an academic paper, <laughs> but I'm going to, by Negro and, and Heckert here, is about the German success story in biogas. 7,000 biogas plants in Germany. It's because they went through all seven steps of the energy technology innovation system. Wisconsin, here you go. Here's the playbook. You want to look at this. <coughs> you saw this slide earlier. This is really what energy technology innovation is, which is 30, about 40 years of research at government labs, universities, private sector, this has resulted in the same period depicted here in a 99% drop in the price of solar. Energy technology innovation works. It makes a difference. And so we really need to encourage that in this marketplace uh, here in the U.S. And, in, and as well in Wisconsin. But the challenge, of course, is, and we all know about this, and I won't go into great depth, getting innovation to market is not easy. People kind of misunderstand this valley of doubt. They kind of think it's just in the early stage here. Oh, probably knows more about this than I do. It's really the whole way. <laughs> you can fall into that valley of death anywhere along the way in this competitive system. And it's for all these reasons, and I'm not going to go into a deep dive here again because we want to keep it short so we have uh, some discussion on this. Here in the United States, you know, we, we, we uh, have uh, our energy world regulated by 50 different states. It's kind of convoluted. Uh, you know, uh, the federal government actually over time has played an increasing role in energy policy, uh, particularly through FERC. Uh, but uh, I think, you know, we, we still need to sort of set a vision, set a goal, as some of the other speakers said, uh, for the United States to really move ahead. Uh, I wanted to briefly touch on some policy areas because this is a policy summit. Um, we, we have this process for reviewing uh, our utility futures at most, in most states, uh, integrated resource planning is called IRP. But I think we need to rethink this here, and here's some of the start to rethinking this. I really think this area of risk is ripe for more research and more understanding. We cannot plan for an energy future if we do not do a better job of really monetizing risk. Also, that water usage one really jumps out at me. That energy water nexus is incredible. You can't have one without the other. Water may drive this debate in the future more than anything. So I think we need to build this into the uh, uh, planning process of the, of the energy system. And I hope maybe some of us can work together on how to do this right uh, here in the Midwest and in Wisconsin. <coughs> Similarly, some good folks over at Sears thought about this. They have a really great study, which I recommend you look at. They looked at this combination of, of uh, 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 both cost and time and uh, put it into a ranking system. Uh, and I think this needs to be likewise built into our planning process as we go forward to think about how we move ahead in, in, in some of these areas. And here you can read that quote. I won't read it for you. I'll read some other material. Um, I told my friends in the utility industry I'd show them a little love because uh, they've, they've been criticized a little bit today, but when I read this, they won't think I'm showing them any love. Uh, today's electric utilities have average asset utilization, utilization rates below 50%, and they spend less than 2% of their revenues, revenues on research and development. That is not an energy technology innovation system. Asset utilization rates in the electric sector are below the levels typically found of other capital-intensive industries, which, of course, utility is, which are often more like at about 75% or greater. The rate of utility spending on research and development is less than one-tenth the average rate of all sectors of the U.S. economy 
a much smaller fraction of a rate in most productive sectors. Our utility sector has to change, but we have to help them change, and that's the key. And I think we'll all touch on that a little bit. I'm going to kind of skip through some of this in terms of the feed-in tariffs effectiveness around the world because we don't have a lot of time. But I'll stop here briefly because, again, I did tie some of this into the research on energy technology innovation systems. Which is that these two scholars reviewed all of the other studies out there and said basically the feed-in tariff is the most effective policy at matching up with the energy, the seven steps of the energy technology innovation system. So as we evaluate policies in the future, I think this is worth thinking about. There's a lot of debate, you know, is RPS better, is that metering better? I'm not going to get too deep into that today, maybe if we have a discussion afterwards. But the feed-in tariff really works for the energy technology innovation system. And if you uh, care to read another academic study, it is cited there. So the U.S. preference is RPS. Um, it is actually starting to really show some positive impacts. It's not a bad policy. Uh, and in fact, if we didn't have it, we'd really be treading the water. But uh, uh, a fair amount of the academic research really gives the RPS actually kind of a mixed grade in terms of its effectiveness. And so, I don't know what that means. I think, again, that's part of the discussion here. I don't really want to undermine the RPS, <laughs> because <laughs> what else do we have <laughs> in some states? But I think it is worth thinking about as we go forward, what's a more effective policy? Is it the feed-in tariff? Is it something else? I'm not totally wedded to the feed-in tariff, just primarily to it. And I don't want to really get into the PTC and ITC other than to say that it's been incredibly effective over the last couple of years, and it's gone. Uh, and here's what happens when it's gone, historically. So um, I'm not so sure that's going to happen this time. You are the experts out there in wind and solar, etc. Um, I think the, that we're actually pretty strong in the market and we won't see the kind of drop-offs we saw previously when they dropped this tax credit, but it's rough sailing for a while, I think. So I really want to just quickly then wrap up and say, how do we move ahead? How do we really start to solve this, this uh, energy system challenge, uh, particularly to encourage more technology innovation? Because I think while solar is great, wind is great, biogas is great, Natural grass, natural grass, natural gas is uh, <laughs> is okay, <laughs> but um, um, we really need innovation here. We need to find out what other combinations can we put together, what other technologies can we add to it for really long-term sustainable solutions. And so, just a couple of big big picture thoughts. Um, I really think we need to think about more about this synergy with natural gas and renewable energy, how they can work together. Uh, we really need to think about this concept of energy technology. We need to let new players come into the system. I can't wait for Google Energy. That's going to that's be a lot of fun when that happens. And here's the big one I want us to think about. Electric utility re-regulation. Bruce Biop, my friend out there, came up with that term. I stole it. Um, it's not the same as deregulation. Re-regulation recognizes that there's a lot of value in the utilities and the infrastructure that they have in place. We need to partner with them, as I think a number of speakers have already said, and figure out a way that they can survive in the new world and all of us can prosper. <coughs> and we need innovation and system solutions. And all of this can be found at this website here. Um, and I thank you for your time. Aaron Rogers. <laughs> but uh, Aaron, uh, Gary and I, uh, we've been catching up. I haven't seen Gary for a number of years. He and I, uh, well, I was in state government in Minnesota. He was in state government here in <coughs> Wisconsin, and I'm glad to see us both gainfully, still gainfully employed and doing things that we love to do. So. <laughs> Very good. Uh, so, what I was planning to do, besides, so I want to touch on a bunch of stuff that's been going on in Minnesota. We have a lot of, lot to, that we would, I would want to brag about to you, but I, I think we'll be, um, I'll be gentle. Uh, I want to give you a sense of who CE is, but not so much, because I don't know that we have the time for it. I want, so I do want to touch on some you know, the Minnesota clean energy programs, not just where we are, but some things that are in the pipeline, which are uh, pretty exciting. And then a couple of projects that CEE is working on uh, that touch on some of the things that were discussed this morning uh, and at lunch uh, by Colorado. So I'll just jump right in. 
Hi, Michael. Hi, Michael. How are you? I gotta come all the way to Madison to see my buddy Mike Noble. <laughs> or on to it. Or on to it. <laughs> Uh, CEE, we're the Center for Energy and Environment. We started uh, as the Minneapolis Energy Office uh, back in 1979. So we're just entering our 35th year. Uh, uh, and we formed the nonprofit corporation, uh, the Center for Energy and Environment, in 1989. Our mission is to advance the public interest in uh, cleaner energy and a healthier economy. And we focus uh, strongly on the public interest, the consumer protection reliability of service, economic development are as important to us in many respects as environmental protection and reducing the environmental impacts of energy generation and consumption. So we focus highly on all our work on these four quadrants of the public interest. We have four areas of expertise. We have a group of folks who do technical research, building optimization, uh, mostly energy efficiency uh, uh, technologies, clean indoor clean air is also an area that we uh, focus on for research. We run a number of energy programs, uh, most of them in Minnesota. We received uh, national awards uh, from ACEEE uh, for three of those programs last year, something we spend a lot of time and a lot of pr uh, pride in. Project financing, mostly uh, small business and residential uh, energy efficiency and renewable projects, and then the work that I'm working on is policy innovation stuff. They, these, they are, our activity in these areas all sort of uh, reinforce uh, each other and um, uh, make us better in each of these areas. I'm going to skip ahead across some things, although I, one, one thing I wanted to point out, uh, we have the CE Policy Advisory Roundtable, people that we work with closely on a monthly basis to get together and talk about uh, uh, great things and, and great ideas. One of those, the members of that uh, group is the uh, project developer for the Aurora project, the solar project we heard about this morning um, that the, uh, the, the ALJ in the Xcel Energy Resource uh, Acquisition Process, which is a re the acronym, it's a Competitive Resource Acquisition, acquisition project, Process, it's referred to as CRAP. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, Betsy Engel King sits on our, on our round table and uh, has been uh, sort of walking on air for the past uh, ever since that ALJ report came out. So, I just quickly go through some things that, we're, that are in place in Minnesota now that are driving the, the clean energy uh, activity that we have there. We have one of the more aggressive uh, renewable energy uh, standards in the country. It's 25% uh, for um, most of the industry and 30% by 2024 XL. Uh, what made this the, the, as aggressive as it was is where we were uh, with regard to coal on our system at the time when, when we started to, to work on this. So it, it, at the time uh, that this was enacted back in 2007, it was after a number of years we've been, uh, we've been working on renewables, but uh, the amount of new renewables relative to the coal that was on the system at the time is what really made this uh, an aggressive activity. Uh, we have an energy efficiency standard of one and a half percent annually of, of electric sales, one percent of natural gas sales, and although other states have now uh, enacted more aggressive uh, targets, ours is built on a base of, we've been doing programs since 1979 when uh, CEE began, uh, so we have had a long history of activity in energy efficiency in Minnesota. So continuing one and a half percent every year, it's a it's a really uh, uh, aggressive target. It's a it's it's a it's a it's a reach every year. We now have a new solar energy standard, one and a half percent by 2020. I'm sure Michael Noble will talk a little bit about that when it gets to him. One of uh, he's following this panel. One of the things. Uh, that has had a, a large impact on carbon reductions in Minnesota is the Voluntary Emissions uh, re Reduction Rider. Uh, it allows utilities to uh, recover costs outside of a rate case uh, for the cost of voluntary emission reduction projects. And I want to show you, uh, this is one of the utilities in, that serves in Minnesota. XL Energy is our largest utility. It serves here in Wisconsin as well as one of the smaller ones here. In Minnesota, it's by far the largest. Uh, and you can see of these policies, 
The, the green bar is, is the wind that is on the system as a result of the Minnesota, primarily as a result of the Minnesota uh, standard. Yellow is the energy efficiency uh, standards that we've been working on over here. The, this pan bar is the voluntary reductions, or what we refer to as the Metropolitan Emissions Reduction Project, or MERP. So that just gives you a sense of the impact of the policies that Minnesota has enacted over here on one utility system. Uh, there was a WRI study that came out yesterday uh, that looked at Minnesota's policies and is projecting that Minnesota would be on track for a 30% reduction on a, on a um, absolute tonnage basis, a 30% reduction in CO2 emissions from the utility sector over a 2011 um, baseline uh, by uh, uh, early in the 2020s. Uh, here are some things that are pretty exciting about, uh, and you've heard <coughs> some of them this morning uh, being touched on. We have uh, Last session, the Minnesota legislature enacted a required a study done uh, for 40, at least 40 percent uh, renewables by 2030. Uh, it's a it's a renewable integration study. In the past, these integration studies have been primarily how do you how do you fit uh, trans on the transmission grid? How do you fit additional uh, um, variable resources on the transmission grid? This one will have the, add, the added complexity of how do you operate a system that may on some days have 80% wind uh, available. Uh, it will be, a, I think, a nation-leading, ground-breaking kind of effort that will be able to really uh, uh, move uh, renewables in the region. Um, you heard Carl mention uh, community solar. XL Energy was required to uh, develop and file a renewable uh, community gar gardens uh, community solar uh, program, which they have, and that proceeding is ongoing. That those will be available by mid 2014. Value of solar, which has many uh, 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 aspects about it that that remind me of a feed-in tariff. What the idea is to it was a, a developed as an alternative to uh, net metering. Uh, when I was at the utility, I was pushing, uh, when I was at the Xcel Energy, I was pushing the concept, we called it buy all, sell all, so that, that rather than netting the amount of kilowatt hours that are on, used on site and produced on site, the you know, utilities are concerned that when you net those kilowatt hours, there's a loss of, that the, 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 the net metered customer isn't contributing to the grid uh, to the extent that they should. So we were proposing a buy-all, sell-all, where the, the utility would buy all the production uh, from the, the on-site uh, installation and the customer would, would and sell the customer all its electricity needs. So you wouldn't have the netting of those kilowatt hours. The, the critical thing that we couldn't figure out was what was the, how, how do you set the appropriate buy rate in a buy-all, sell-all regime? And I was at a NARU conference uh, and I, I uh, somebody was presenting uh, on uh, Carl's uh, program in Austin, uh, the value of solar, uh, uh, the net metering 2.0 project that he started down in Austin. And I was sitting next to one of Excel's uh, uh, Maki Monks and, <laughs> and said, that's it, uh, that's how we do it. And so, uh, so that's what the, the legislature enacted that sort of regime. Uh, but now we're going through a very detailed and, and uh, uh, problematic and uh, contentious but very interesting process to layer, find out what those layers of value that each individual uh, uh, distributed PV uh, installation may provide to the utility on the system. So that's where we are. That's some of the things that we're set up for. A couple, I just want to touch briefly, if I have any more time, on a couple of projects that we have going that go to the issue of utility innovation. You know, we have, we've heard the, this new, <coughs> crying need for the new utility business model. And you know, community, communities and citizens are demanding new and different things from their utility and the util that, that the utility just isn't designed or uh, hasn't uh, been constructed uh, in to provide them. It, it cuts against the way they do business and the way they make money. So we're working with the city of Minneapolis. Uh, the city had just gone through a very comprehensive 
uh, climate action planning process and, uh, and uh, uh, adopted a new uh, climate action plan just this summer. But they realized at the same time is that they can't, the, on the current status quo relationship with the utilities that serve the city, they, they're required to essentially just rely on those utilities to help them meet their goals. And the, the, there's, a, the, the, there's a tension there. The, utility, the city wants more influence and control over how uh, energy services are delivered in the city so that they can have more comfort that they're going to meet their climate action goals. So we've been contracted for, by the city to look at a number of different pathways, enhancing their current franchise uh, agreement with the utilities that serve the city. XL is one of them. Uh, uh, a city, a city utility partnerships, what are the different ways that the city and the utility can work together on a formal basis uh, that would enhance the city's influence and control over services. Uh, community choice aggregation, which is a model that has been used elsewhere in the country, but is, is, would be remarkably uh, different uh, to introduce into Minnesota. It would take some a diff, uh, quite a bit of work to get that to fit. And then the formation of a municipal utility or municipalization. Uh, so we are in the process now. <coughs> this, I'll skip this slide. What we are recommending to the city is the formation of a, of a clean energy partnership and a formal nonprofit organization that would the, the board of directors would be from, uh, made up of city leaders, uh, utility leaders, uh, leaders from business community com, uh, and other uh, non-governmental organizations that operate in the city. So all these key sectors of the city are all pulling in the same direction uh, to, um, to oversee and plan and, and market and uh, work together on uh, organizing clean energy activities within the city uh, and, and being able to hold each other accountable over time toward meeting these uh, city uh, climate action plan goals. The way we think about it, it is not, it's not just a one-off for the city of Minneapolis where we would like to see a network of cities that are undergoing, you know, a detailed, comprehensive climate action plan setting strong goals about local energy uh, implementation and then forming clean energy partnerships with their utilities to meet those, to you know, work together to meet those goals and you have this network of cities across the region that are all pulling together in the same direction on things. That by itself can be a, a, a dramatic force for good in the world. We're also working on with XL Energy on that on that one, uh, the the Minneapolis project. XL is a little nervous so, about some things that we're working on, but in this one, we're partnering with them to take a deep dive into their business model, how they make money, how they where their revenues come from uh, in their current operations, and how do we design a system that better aligns. The financial health of the utility with the public interest. We want to enable a reliable transmission to a decarbonized utility sector. We want to recognize the value of ongoing, uh, of the, the ongoing value of utilities, and we want to empower consumers uh, by enabling high penetration of distributed energy resources. These things, there's a lot of conflict in, uh, built into this in the current uh, utility business model, but Excel has really stepped up to the plate and. Uh, committed to helping work through, they recognize, I think, that the, the, they need to solve these problems. And we heard yesterday that another big utility in Minnesota, Minnesota Power, is also committed uh, to participating in this program with us. So that's what I had put together for you. <laughs> so I'm going to uh, do this a little different. Um, I'm going to walk you through three things. <coughs> Uh, the first is a very brief storyline of what MWORK is. Um, then I'm going to give you some slides from a video that's in process. It's the first time I've ever pitched these slides, so be humble, be kind, and I'll walk you through where the jobs used to be in Wisconsin, how this area has historically been the center of excellence for energy, power control back into the 1800s, and then link it back to where we're going in the year 2014 and what we're doing to grow jobs because part of this session is about how to get jobs from clean tech. So I'll walk you through those three subjects. Let's go. So who knows about what the Midwest Energy Research Consortium? Anybody? 
Okay, well, thank you. That's pretty good. So Reader's Digest, we've been around for three years. It's been an organization that's a public-private partnership between industry. We have probably 50 industrial members, academic institutions, government and non-government organizations, all focused on energy, power, and control. It's the secret sauce, really, that's driving growth in this region. Folks don't understand. But energy power control electric machines is the fastest growing segment of the marketplace here in Wisconsin. Um, as an organization, we were small. We had eight members when we started three years ago. We then tripled in size, so 26 members, 27 members. Uh, we have 57 members at the end of last year, which ended in July. And now, as of last week, we have 66 members. In the short two plus years that we funded research, we did a couple million bucks of research. We'll be funding another half a million dollars this year, as well as train 50 electrical assemblers, assemblers using grant money that we solicited on behalf of our members. So good things in a short two and a half year period. Why Wisconsin? Why Wisconsin? Wisconsin started, there are 900 companies here. There's over 100,000 employees with $38 billion worth of sales in what we call the energy power control space. And when you expand that footprint to the eight contiguous states around the Great Lakes, there are 526,000 jobs that are clean tech jobs. Put that in perspective, put that in perspective, California, supposedly the clean, clean tech area of the world, only has 400 some of thousand. We are the clean tech center of the universe here in Wisconsin. And it doesn't start at the border, it goes across all eight states in the contiguous region. But where did that come from? <coughs> so I'm going to show you what will be a video. I'm going to be real quick because we don't have a lot of time. But it all started back in 1867 when EP Alice started the Reliance Works as a, a motor engine factory in Wisconsin. It became single-handedly the largest steam engine provider in the world. It had all sorts of the world's largest steam engines that were developed in Wisconsin, in Milwaukee. It ended up having nearly 5,000 employees in what we call the Menominee Valley. Because of that pull, he brought the best engineers in the world. He brought the best talented supply chain in the world. And you look at the companies that are around there. Is there a point to this thing? Yeah, there is. So you see Alan Bradley. You see A.O. Smith. You see Harnischfeger. You see key companies that all developed because we were the largest steam engine capital of the world. Those were the characteristics of what we call an industrial commons. It was a self-generating thing where technology grew jobs, grew excitement, grew industry, and grew an industrial commons. That industrial commons had a large supply chain base. P&H, which we now know as a large crane corporation, was a contract manufacturer for, for Alice. Alice had a crane failure. His own engineer came up with a great solution to make a better crane. He said, ah, I'm a steam engine guy. I don't want to be a crane guy. They, sp what happened? they spun that off. Oh, they spun that off. And uh, a new company became the P&H Crane Company right here in Wisconsin. The crane company wanted a better system to control cranes. Uh, Lionel Bradley, in 1901, created the compression rheostat. And that became Rockwell Automation, which was formerly Allen Bradley, one of the largest automation companies in the world. Right down the street, Johnson Controls was founded, was, uh, was created. Uh, Warren Johnson created an electrochemical process that developed the first yep, thermostat. And it became the foundation for Johnson Controls, a $41 billion company with hundreds of thousands of employees around the world. That continued to go ahead and spin off more jobs, more companies, where A.O. Smith, I'm going to just buzz through these because we don't have a lot of time. A.O. Smith created uh, bicycle companies called, eventually, Briggs & Stratton. Created additional companies called Harley Davidson. Created additional companies called Cutler Hammer, uh, Rexnord. And eventually, where I was a general manager for, DRS Technologies, which is the former Eaton Navy Controls and before that color hammer. There's a legacy of technology that drives innovation, that drives corporate development, 
that creates a community <coughs> commons that then provides jobs and income to communities. That was our history here, and I will attest that it's being rebuilt now. And it's being, being, it's being rebuilt now. So back to what M-Work is. M-Work is dedicated to growing that industrial commons, <coughs> linking academia, linking industrial companies, <coughs> driving together government and non-government organizations to make a difference. We say energy power control. For those who don't mean by that, it's power generation, and we're frankly agnostic. We drive renewables. We love renewables. We don't mind fossil. We don't mind nuclear, as long as it's done responsibly. We love bioenergy. There are key <coughs> generators in, this in the region that are all in that area. Uh, power is transmission, distribution, power storage, conversion, and high-quality fidelity power as well as we are the center of excellence for the largest industrial automation, building automation, energy management companies in the world in our eight state region. We are together can continue to drive what I will call that industrial commons and create an environment for new growth, new revenue, and jobs. So MWORK started with only eight companies, four, excuse me, four companies and four um, academic institutions. These are our companies today. They're a who's who of the energy power control space. We today have 10, there we, go. we have 10 academic partners who are no longer just Wisconsin. We have the University of Illinois in Chicago. Together, they work with academics throughout the region and industrial partners and drive new technologies and new growth. We created a planning function in 2012 that outlined a strategic plan that said the way to grow is in selected technology focus areas. We have six focus areas that we think are key to driving growth. We do roadmaps for each one of these. We're on our, third, on our second roadmap. Our first one was on distributed energy resource and systems, DERS, microgrids for those, those of you who know it as microgrids. That market space will grow from a $1 billion market to a $3 billion North American marketplace in five years. If you go to our website, you'll see an action plan that resulted from our market research that then identified a technology roadmap of new technologies that we're funding today that will drive jobs tomorrow in DERS. We're in the process of doing a new roadmap on building energy efficiency. It was kicked off in September. That roadmap will be issued as a final product in, in March of 2014. Each one of these roadmaps costs about $100,000. It's done with academic members, linked with industrial members on a steering committee. It takes around six months to do it, and again, it identifies the gaps, <coughs> looks at what new technologies need to be done, what new workforce development training needs to be done to have the skill sets to execute that, and moves forward. We will conclude our strategic plan in 2016, and we'll then do uh, both energy water nexus, renewable energy, energy storage, and biofuels roadmaps over the next two years. And that will complete this triennium of activity with the result in growth in jobs and revenue for our members and the region. That's the purpose and where it exists for. Whoops, sorry. Uh, the target is implemented through five <coughs> mission areas. First, we look at market and industry standards and what's driving the marketplace for DERS, for instance, and we identify what those growth engines are, what the new technology and innovation needs are, what public policy is needed to change, what workforce training is needed done, and then how do we collaborate strategically to go execute the plan. That's our structure. We use a technology focus area with mission areas to drive growth. Our Next activity will be to implement an accelerator. And this is a very specific portion of our strategic plan that identifies how we can go ahead. And I heard someone use the word valley of death. It's used way too often, but I'll reuse it again. And how to go from a prototype into commercialized production with the quality standards you expect for commercial, with the on-time delivery standards and affordability standards that are not there in prototyping activities. Our accelerator will be in what is the old Eaton Research Campus. We just uh, recently re uh, leased, uh, took an option to lease 65,000 square feet 
in the Eaton Research Building on 27th Street. Uh, it will have within it regional and international companies that are our members and new recruits, market and technology innovators, startups, universities, private and national labs, new entrepreneur startups, as well as from our members, fellows that are released out of their jobs at their home headquarters and allowed to work in a small office where they can actually get creative. Um, and universities and workforce educators. Um, these are the key drivers that we see. We will use again roadmaps, develop new technologies, products and systems, drive jobs, develop new careers, and work with our members to create technology platforms to educate, train, and fill the proverbial skills gap. It's really a commitment gap. I'm tired of hearing a skills gap. It's a commitment gap. Companies need to be committed. People need to be committed. And that's the way we drive growth. Uh, this is a picture of the building. Uh, it's a 200,000 square foot building. We will have a third of it, and there's another third that's common space. Uh, it would have all the attributes that you need for an accelerator. Uh, this is an example of one of the spaces and uh, a Bruce Byoff special image in that space on the types of labs we'll have. There'll be co-located labs with industrial partners um, that will be focusing on energy power conversion in one lab, energy storage in another lab, and building energy efficiency in a third lab. The goal for all of this is very, very clear with metrics that are prescribed in our strategic plan. We will go grow our own investment by 25% over the next three years. <coughs> this year we're investing $500,000 of MWorks own money in six technology <coughs> projects. Um, we will go measure and census our members to see that their growth over the planning horizon is 5% of their revenue and that we expect 7.5% of workforce growth over that same window of time. Now, where I was, nearly 50% of my staff could have retired in five years. The 50% of the touch labor force at DRS Technologies, where I was a general manager, could have retired in five years. A third of the engineering staffs around town could drive, retire in five years. The goal is to create a structure where we recover and grow the workforce in energy power and control, and to continue to grow as an organization where we will have over 100 members by the end of our next fiscal year. That's it. Questions? Where you're at now, and I realize it's still early in the process, where do you see the most potential for job creation within those six focus areas? Well, we've done the two first roadmaps. Um, so DERS will go from a billion dollars to three billion dollars, but the... You stand? Oh. You see me? I, I'm short. Um, so building energy efficiency of the three of the six is probably the largest single growth area. Okay. All right. It, it's really where uh, low-hanging fruit can generate huge savings in energy, huge growth in jobs, and as my friend Bruce would say, it's all about a system. So as you do systems engineering and you drive automation into building energy efficiency projects, you grow growth jobs, create a more efficient environment and actually make a world that's easy to live in. Um, so that's where I think the largest growth in jobs are. Where the region has unique advantages is in that um, energy storage um, in and water technology, the energy water nexus. So those are all, we, we picked all six of those after going through probably 20 or 30 areas that we could focus on because we know those all are big, big drivers. But by building energy efficiency by far is the largest of all. Okay. Sure. How are you? Good to see you. Um, do you see policies? You, you talked about different things that would enhance this happening. Do you see policies like benchmarking um, and disclosure as helpful as having the two states in the same And I'll repeat this. There was a question about uh, policies and disclosure that could help facilitate. Um, really some of the tech focus areas that, that Alan's talking about, right? Yeah. Um, <laughs> I come from a shipyard, sorry about that. Um, 
Yeah, what, what I really think is going to drive public policy is market forces. And so I think it's the other way around. Public policy doesn't drive the market. The market drives correct public policy. Uh, I think there does, does need to be public policy changes. But as paradigm shifts happen in technology and marketplace, it just plows over public policy issues eventually. It takes a while. I mean, people go back and look at the original Industrial Revolution, and it was horrible, man. But yet, we got a clean, cleaner environment. We have a more safe place to work. And public policy follows market needs, not the other way around. So I think public policy is important, but I really think when industry says it needs something, when a workforce says it needs something, it shapes public policy and moves that forward that way more effectively. Mm -hmm. Touch on that, the, the, the building disclosure. One of the things that that, that that kind of a policy does in the city of Minneapolis is one of those uh, that has a building disclosure uh, policy. It, it, it demonstrates where the need is, where, the, where is the low-hanging fruit that the market then can, can uh, respond to. Apart from having that kind of information, it's hard to know where to go, uh, where you can spend the dollars and have the best bang for the buck. Well, so. One of the things we did promote with the, the city of Milwaukee is, um, can people hear me with that that mic? I'm sure I can talk to you loud. I'm a father-in-law of Jack, he's 91, so I'm used to talking real loud. <laughs> um, you know, people love competition. And so having um, the best energy efficient factory, having the most energy efficient uh, neighborhood or household are different competitions that we're trying to engender in the public dialogue to use that as a way to just gain some momentum <coughs> and to go focus and drive changes that you know, we know will be good. I look out of my seventh floor office window and look down and I count the roofs that still have snow and I count the hundreds that don't have snow, and I say, oh, I know where we need to do some work. It's real easy. Just look out from... That's a building disclosure. Without a doubt. <laughs> Come to my office, you'll see it. Yeah, yeah. And uh, Kelly, by the way, is out here with a mic in case we have some questions in the midsection or toward the back of the room as well. Um, well I've got one, and I see Clay Norma was here, uh, Geo Investors, and uh, a variety of things that you've been working on around the state. And as you know, Clay, one of the... One of the debates going on right now is in the investing world is clean debt debt. You know, sort of is there where are the dollars? And there's a surge for a while. Where are the dollars coming from? There's a lot of back and forth on that. Some say it depends on sector. What do you guys think? What do, what do you see out there in terms of investment dollars that could be going into the kinds of sectors that we're discussing? Well, one thing that Mike and I were Mike and I well, I'll say. Uh, Mike and I were talking during the break about, about some things going on in our respective states and, and in the Midwest. And I do think, that, you know, the point that I kind of touched on with utilities, uh, you know, they're going to, this is where I give them a little love. They're going to say the reason that their investment in R&D is so small is because of the regulations. And they're kind of right. It's, it's an honest assessment. So I think this is where policy can match up with creating innovation. Utilities have assets. Utilities have money. Utilities have shareholders. You know, there's an opportunity to take some of that and apply it to technologies. But one of the things that I think we need to think about is allowing them to have some experimental rates and to experiment with innovation. And quite frankly, the, the public's going to have to cover the loss if the idea was not a good idea. You know, allow them some flexibility. And that's going to be kind of a radical idea and probably one that might get me egged in some circles. But I think we need to really think about this concept of re-regulation and looking at new ways to allow for innovation in a sector that you know, might be lagging uh, in, in some innovation because of uh, uh, regulatory restrictions. Okay. On that, I just, on that is one of my favorite topics, that utilities, we... Because of the business model that, we, that has, has worked extremely well for the past hundred years, the, we, the, the goal was electricity everywhere at the least cost. And it, and it really, it was, it's a fantastic success story. It, we're realizing it has significant problems and things are shifting. But we, have, uh, we, we haven't wanted our utilities to be innovative. We, we've incented them not to be innovative. When, when a utility makes a decision, it's usually a 50-year decision, and so we don't want them to do dumb things quickly. We want them to <laughs> think about it and go slowly. And so the, it's not—it's not just the the business model isn't just how they make money. It's about 
uh, giving them the space to think about things differently. And I think that's why the experimental tariffs that you refer to, these you know, different ways for utility to try different things about and, and, and recover things <coughs> in different ways, we're going to have to give them that space uh, to some extent. Uh, and we also have to penalize them if they continue to do that. <laughs> okay. Um, Clay, let me, I'm, I'm singling you out, sorry about that, but what are you hearing from your colleagues in the investment world, clean tech investment world, around the, around the country right now? Where's the money going to come from? Uh, well, I do think you're right that, that um, venture, clean tech venture capital uh, is, you know, in a, in a trough. So, you know, I, I hear recently of, of those, you know, that, that um, you know, small fund, I talked to a small fund this week who said they would never see the opportunities that they're seeing. Um, you know, they would have been passed by them, they, they would have never got a phone call, uh, you know, four years ago that they're seeing. So it is indicative of, of where that's at. Uh, you know, I don't, I don't have any great answer or silver bullet to that other than that that is a good point in that if you talk about a lot of people in the room probably being interested in funding to take small enterprises to the next step mm -hmm. in this area, it's, there, there is some headwind from, from that capital source. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But it's cyclical, so it could, it could come back and back again. Okay, others? Questions from others? I know we might be a little over time anyway, Tyler, is that right? Okay. Okay, well with that, I want to make sure we thank our panelists.